Redmi K20 Pro. Depending on who you are, you've either heard a ton of hype around this for a while now, or this is literally the first time you're ever hearing about it right now. I feel like this phone picks up right where the Pocophone left off. It's very similar to the Pocophone in more ways than one, but instead of just nailing a few key specs for a super low price, this Redmi K20 Pro feels like a super complete, all around, basically flagship level phone. It has essentially everything for 400 bucks. And that's why it's blowing up. It's definitely more expensive than the $300 Pocophone, which is absolutely crazy. But this, in this package, is definitely a better, more all around phone. You'll see what I mean. But first, I want to address the whole naming scheme. So when I was first put onto this phone, you guys put it on my radar, a lot of tweets at me, a lot of emails asking me to review Redmi K20 Pro. So I look it up and it looks like this. So I look down at my desk and I already have this phone right here. So I'm like, oh, I already have a K20 Pro, except it's not. It says, uh, says me on the back and it came in a box from Xiaomi that said Xiaomi Mi 9T. There's a couple other slightly different things about it, but they look nearly identical. So I look up the specs of this Mi 9T to see how similar they are. It's essentially exactly the same as the K20 Pro, but with a Snapdragon 730. But then I unbox it and I log into my Google account on it and it says, welcome to your Redmi K20, which is making me even more confused. But then I finally do get the Redmi K20 Pro. Turns out the K20 Pro is just an upgraded version of the K20. This has the Snapdragon 855. The K20 has a Snapdragon 730, which has a global version called the Xiaomi Mi 9T, which is an upgraded version of the Xiaomi Mi 9, if you follow all of that, but none of that really matters. What matters is the K20 Pro deserves the attention it's getting because it legitimately tries to include literally everything you could possibly expect out of a flagship, but at a lower price. Now it's not all the highest quality. It definitely has a quantity. It has almost everything, but it's still a $400 phone. So aesthetically, first of all, it's pretty unique looking with the colors sort of dancing down the sides. And then depending on how the light hits it, this shimmery pattern changes. It's pretty cool, but it's actually also still glass and still a fingerprint magnet. But this thing is already starting off with a leg up. You typically expect budget phones to have plastic and cheap materials. This one is legit metal and glass. Uh, USB type C, you got it. A slight curve to the back glass, you got it. Headphone jack, you got that. A full screen display from top to bottom, thin bezels, you got it. Pop-up selfie camera, you got it. A built-in LED light. Fingerprint reader underneath the glass, you got that too. 4,000 milliamp hour battery, you got that. Snapdragon 855, it's all here. Pretty much the only hardware thing this guy's missing if you're comparing it to flagships is water resistance, and wireless charging. So, you know, it is a glass back with no wireless charging. I've said before, if you're gonna do that, just go with a high quality plastic so you avoid being breakable, but oh well. So like I've said, the list of things that this phone has, as you've heard, is kind of amazing, but the actual quality of all these different things varies. Not all specs are created equal. The natural place to start is a display, and it's pretty nice, to be honest. It's a 6.4 inch, 1080p AMOLED, no notch, thin bezels, and it's pretty bright. It's visible outdoors with fairly decent colors, maybe a little big if anything, but we're so used to seeing so many budget phones with either big chins and big bezels or smaller screens or notches. This one's just clean and it's flat. So I'm reminded again of how much I like this versus the displays that sort of spill over the sides. So I really like this screen. To me, this is the best display in any mid-range phone. And then underneath that display glass, there is a fingerprint reader which again, that's pretty impressive for a mid-ranger, the fact that it's there in the first place. But this reader itself, it's not that fast, so you can kind of get used to it. It's a little bit of a delay when you press it, um, but it's in this weird place where it's slower than most other in-glass fingerprint readers on great phones, but also slower than the capacitive ones are used to, but at least it's cooler, it's under the screen. And then like we've also seen lately to achieve the full screen design, pop-up selfie camera. And this one, has a light on it. Uh, I don't know if that achieves anything other than looking kind of cool, but the mechanism is decently fast. It's rated for 300,000 opens and closes. You can use it for RGB face unlock, but I don't recommend that. And it even has automatic free fall detection. So if you're taking a selfie and you drop the phone and it has a free fall, it actually closes the camera app 
and shuts it to avoid damage if it lands on it. But a low key, pretty important part of it is that light in the selfie camera actually shines through the top of it. So it can act as a sort of a notification LED. So you can see if you're plugged in and charging, it lights up to tell you. And when you're finished charging, that changes. Really the only thing I don't like about this selfie camera is the photos it takes, which are straight garbage. Like this is possibly the worst selfie camera I can remember using since I started to review phones. Uh, there's absolutely no dynamic range. Colors are pretty terrible, very, very soft detail. Yes, beauty mode is off. Like I just don't know why it's this bad. But you know what makes it even more crazy? How good the back cameras are. This K20 Pro again has yet another flagship looking spec, an array of triple cameras on the back, a 48 megapixel main camera, an eight megapixel telephoto, and a 13 megapixel ultra wide. So that main sensor is a Sony, it's an IMX586. So it's the same sensor that we've seen in a couple other Honor and Vivo phones that have performed pretty well. It'll shoot 4K 60 FPS video with any of the camera lenses. So yes, you can shoot video with the ultra wide camera, unlike the OnePlus 7 Pro. It'll even shoot 960 FPS slow motion. Now it's not high resolution at all, but you know, definitely more of a gimmick, but that's still pretty cool. And then for photos, I was of course expecting maybe some average photos, some that maybe look better if they're in great light. And I was very impressed. Obviously, if you give it a ton of light, you're going to get the best out of the sensor. And this stayed true. HDR was working pretty great. But even the ultra wide camera was giving me some nice shots. The color reproduction wasn't too oversaturated or overdone with the processing. Sometimes you see too much sharpening in these phones. That wasn't here. I was more impressed often than I thought I would be. It's not the fastest camera in the world, but overall the image quality, not bad. And even at night, like in, in dark environments where you expect it to fall apart, yeah, it totally does. The noise reduction goes super overboard and everything is super soft and it looks terrible. But if you happen to have a subject that will sit still for you and you turn on night mode, you get some of your sharpness back and the dynamic range actually improves. Like that's, 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 that's pretty good, that's not bad. So really the only thing left is using the phone every day. And again, like I said, technically on paper, it has all those things you'd expect from a flagship, Snapdragon 855, six or eight gigs of RAM and uh, up to 256 gigs of storage. So it's running my UI 10 on top of Android Pie. And this is not my first choice, but it's growing on me. So aesthetically, this is why it's not my favorite, uh, but functionally it's not lacking at all. The app drawer with the search bar at the bottom is nice for reachability. Uh, it actually has a nice clean brightness slider that I've liked for a while. It's like always available, but the glassiness of it all and the, the icons, just certain things are a little too much for me and that's kind of their aesthetic right now. But overall performance, I'd say was about a B. And this is something I actually expected to be better when you have these high end specs, but the animations weren't really smooth all the time. I got occasional hiccups with the keyboard and with opening stuff. Minor things, but stuff you don't really expect to see from a phone with a 1080p display and a high-end chip. So it's still fast, but not really that smooth, if that makes sense. But that battery though, that 4,000 milliamp hour battery they put in this phone gives it a battery life that is right up to par with the other flagships, sometimes better than the OnePlus 7 Pro I've been using. And not only does it have a really large battery and support fast charging, but it also comes with a fast charger in the box and it has this sweet charging animation. So the battery life situation is pretty great on this phone. Look, I'm gonna tell you right now, for the price, Redmi K20 Pro is a great phone. It, it, I think it gets you the closest to forgetting that you spent half what you could have spent on a high-end phone. It gets you the closest to that. But a lot of this is easy to just point out on paper. When you actually use it, there are certain things that keep reminding you that it is a cheaper phone. The vibration motor, for example, pretty cheap, pretty loose, not very good. And when you feel that all the time, you're reminded. Also the single mono speaker at the bottom is super easy to block and that's pretty bad. So if you do audio all the time, you're reminded. The selfie camera, like I talked about, is just absolutely comically awful. And even little things like the slower fingerprint reader. You might not know it's slow if you haven't used a more expensive phone, but I definitely did notice it. But for the most part, the important stuff, the big stuff, your specs, your overall solid build quality, your solid performance, the headphone jack is a nice touch, and the display being better than I'd expected sort of 
fits this where the Pocophone left off, which is a really, really great value. And kind of like that Pocophone, even if you never buy this Redmi K20 Pro or even the Xiaomi Mi 9T, this is still a testament to how good these mid-range and budget phones have gotten lately. So maybe I can't say good phones are getting cheap anymore. Maybe we'll put a little strikeout through that one, but I definitely can say cheap phones are getting good. And I'm glad this one exists to be a part of that movement. So that's been it. Thanks for watching. Catch you guys in the next one. Peace.